The previous videos on this channel have referenced a number of different Hindu texts, and so now we will be recapping the major scriptures within Hinduism. But before we go into them, it is important to understand how Hindu scripture fits into the religion as a whole. Ultimately, Sanadana Dharma is a series of different methodologies and pathways that take the seeking individual to God. These pathways are organised into sampradayas or spiritual lineages, where knowledge and practice is passed down through a chain of initiated masters who have themselves seen the truth of their lineage. Hinduism is genuinely pluralistic, it understands that divinity has different aspects and can be approached in a number of ways. Because of the variance in the way these sampradayas see divinity, naturally they will use, interpret and even ignore different scriptures. Each one will have a unique combination and authoritative interpretation which is designed to guide the seeker to a particular experience of God. So here is an overview of the different scriptures within Hinduism. The two main branches are the Shruti which is made up of the Vedas and the Smriti which is comprised of the Itihasa, the Puranas, the Agamas, the different Sutras, the Dharma Shastras and the Upavedas. Shruti means that which has been heard, in other words it has been downloaded rather than composed. The Vedas are seen as a body of knowledge that has existed eternally and are not the teachings of any individual. As a result they are described as Aparushaya or unauthored. In this sense they are the most ancient and original form of the Hindu religion. Up until 5000 years ago the Vedas were one whole scripture. It was sage Vyasa who divided the Vedas up into four main branches, the Rig, Sama, Yajur and Atarva. Each one of them is further subdivided into the Samitas, Brahmanas, Aranyakas and Upanishads. Most of the Vedas are heavily centred around the Yajna or fire sacrifice. Offerings into the fire ritual are done to please the various gods such as Indra, Agni and Varuna. These gods occupy different roles in creation and in turn bestow gifts such as rains, children and a prosperous place in heaven. The term Yajna however has grown to mean much more than the ancient fire ritual. It is often seen as an inner sacrifice where practice is taken up for spiritual transformation. The Vedic Samitas are a collection of hymns in praise of these gods. The Brahmanas discuss the correct performance of the Yajna with stories and meditations. The Aranyakas provide a more mystical and symbolic meaning of the Vedic ritual. The Upanishads however are less to do with ritual and more to do with how the self relates to God. Texts such as the Brihadaranyaka and the Chandogya Upanishads are perhaps the first scriptures in the world to discuss these principles. They are also some of the first scriptures to teach concepts such as karma and reincarnation. The first two sections together are what can be described as the Karmakanda or the ritual section of the Veda. The Aranyakas but primarily the Upanishads form the Jnanakanda or knowledge section. One ancient school of Hinduism which has little prominence today is the Purva Mimamsa. The philosophy of this tradition taught that there was nothing higher than the performance of Vedic ritual and social duties. For them our purpose was to simply carry out these mechanical rituals and enjoy the results. They were almost entirely centred around the Karmakanda and gave little importance to discovering the mystery of our existence or real devotion to God. The Uttara Mimamsa school of Hinduism, which is popularly known as Vedanta, gave greater importance to the Jnanakanda. For them knowledge about the nature of reality and who we truly are was more important than mere ritual. Within the various Upanishads there are a number of conversations and debates that reveal mystical truths. The famous Mahavakyas such as Aham Brahmasmi, Tattvamasi, Salvam Kalvidam Brahma provide the philosophical foundation for most Hindu thought. But although the Vedas are in theory the most authoritative, they are not necessarily the most referred to. For the devotional traditions in particular, the Upanishads are like the philosophical skeleton describing how everything is linked, while the Gita, Puranas and Agama texts provide the detailed description of the qualities and nature of God. If we move away from the Vedas and the Shruti, we come to the Itihasa which literally means this happened. Here we find scriptures such as the Mahabharata and Ramayana which are recorded historical accounts. Most Hindus will be familiar with these as they play a big role in Indian culture. The original Ramayana was written by Valmiki and contains some 24,000 verses divided into 7 books. 
Rama is described as the incarnation of Vishnu come to rid the world of evil, specifically the king of Lanka, Ravana. The Valmiki Ramayana clearly talks about the divinity of Lord Rama, but is mainly focused on his virtue and his adherence to righteousness. Later we find many new versions of the Ramayana being produced in local languages. There is a Tamil version written by the poet Kamban, and others such as the Ramacharitamanas written by Tulsidas. In these versions of the Ramayana, bhakti or devotion becomes far more prominent. We see how personalities such as Hanuman, Lakshmana and Shabari all wonderfully display perfect service, surrender and unconditional love for Lord Ram. The Mahabharata written by sage Vyasa is a vast work that spans over 100,000 verses within 18 books. It is centred around the feud between the royal cousins, the righteous Pandavas and the evil-minded Kauravas. The conflict climaxes in the Great War in the Kurukshetra battlefield. Unlike the Ramayana which clearly outlines righteousness through Lord Ram's example, the Mahabharata shows how difficult it is to determine what dharma really is. Different individuals who are faced with their own unique challenges give their verdict on righteous action. The reader is constantly asked whether dharma is purely about virtue, or whether it is about fulfilling our position in society, or whether it is about doing whatever it takes to be liberated from birth and death. The various twists and subplots in the narrative debate and explore the tension between these ideas. But the Mahabharata is not just a story, it is a scripture. Woven into this amazing and gripping account are huge amounts of teaching. For instance, there are around 500 chapters where Bhishma discourses at length. He discusses topics from how to rule a kingdom, the conduct of a warrior, vegetarianism, devotion to Vishnu and much more. Although Krishna is not the main personality, he is explicitly declared repeatedly as the Supreme Lord. Throughout this thrilling story we see how he guides and orchestrates events to ensure the success of the Pandavas. But the crown jewel of the Mahabharata is the Bhagavad Gita. When faced with the prospect of destroying the Kauravas and the rest of his family, Arjuna is overcome with emotion and loses the will to fight. He surrenders to Krishna who has taken the role of his charioteer and from there begins one of the greatest of all dialogues. In 18 chapters and 700 verses, Krishna discusses Sankhya, how the eternal soul is different from the material world, Karma Yoga, how to act without attachment to results, and he discusses Dhyana Yoga, how to still the mind in meditation. But it is primarily in the middle six chapters that Krishna explicitly talks about himself as the Supreme Lord, the origin and sustainer of all that exists. He teaches Arjuna the way of Bhakti Yoga and how one can have a mutual loving relationship with a personal God. After revealing his cosmic form, he urges Arjuna to abandon all ideas and take refuge in him. Although the Gita is part of the Mahabharata, it has grown to become independent of it and in many ways it is the flagship scripture of Hinduism. Within a short text we have an immensely profound philosophical and devotional teaching that encompasses most of Hindu spirituality. Next we have the Puranas. There are 18 major ones and amongst these we have Vaishnava Puranas such as the Bhagavat and the Vishnu Purana who hold Narayana or Krishna as the Supreme Lord. There are Shaivite Puranas which place Shiva as the Supreme and there are also passages in certain Puranic texts such as the Markandeya Purana which venerate Devi as the highest. The Puranas are very devotional, describing the qualities of the Supreme Deity, their pastimes, their interactions with devotees and their various avatars or incarnations on earth. Typically, each Purana explains topics like the creation of the universe, the different yugas or ages of time and the various family dynasties right from the first man. There is also an incredible amount of philosophy and knowledge on how to worship. Perhaps the most famous of all the Puranas is the Bhagavad. Also written by Vyasa, there are between 16 to 18,000 verses spread over 12 books. Through the various narrations of Lord Vishnu, the reader is taken on a devotional journey. The peak of this experience lies in the 10th book which describes the events of Lord Krishna. While the Mahabharata mentions him as one character among many others, the Bhagavad Purana is completely centred on Krishna. His birth, his relations with the residents of Vrindavan, the many demons that he killed, his royal life in Dwaraka and the end of his advent are all recorded. The Bhagavad Purana is a meditation specifically designed to awaken bhakti, pure love for God. 
Within the different theistic movements such as Vaishnavism, Shaivism and Shaktism, there are also various ways of worship. There are ritual procedures, festivals, mantras, yoga meditation techniques and specific descriptions on temple structure unique to that deity. All of this knowledge is found in the Tantric Agama scriptures. Texts such as the Pancharacha for Vaishnavas outline how to worship and what customs and etiquette to adhere to. The Shaiva Siddhanta does the same for Shaivites. The Agamas provide an orthodox base for the lived devotional practice within Hinduism. The Sutras are very short, terse statements, often just a few words long. Because they are so brief, they often need commentaries to draw out their meaning. Although there are many of them, there are traditionally six main schools of philosophy and each of them have their own set of sutras which have crystallised the essence of what they teach. Perhaps the two most famous are Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and the Vedanta Sutras. The Vedanta Sutras are of particular interest. They also describe how the individual Atman or soul relates to God. Together with the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, it has been used to formulate different kinds of Vedanta philosophy. Although they are hardly referred to today, it is worth mentioning the Dharma Shastras. These include texts such as the Manu and Yajnavarka Smriti, which attempt to provide some framework for social conduct. Much of it is hardly relevant in contemporary Hinduism. They were written for a society which was centred around the Karmakanda of the Vedas. As a result, much of the instruction relates to maintaining ritual purity. Although Yajna is still carried out today, most Hindus are focused around temple worship or meditation rather than exclusively around the fire sacrifice. Even then, it is important to note that the Dharma Shastras are not laws that Hindus must follow. Hindu masters have referenced the Dharma Shastras but have also chosen to ignore many of the rules stated when they contradict their own philosophy. But it is not only religion and spiritual truth which Hindu scripture covers. There are a number of non-religious texts in the Upavedas. Areas such as the science of health and well-being, warfare, architecture, economics, dance and drama all have their own body of texts written by different rishis. Although not explicitly about finding truth, the various sciences discussed are all presented with a spiritual foundation. In ancient Hindu society, there was no real distinction between the secular and the spiritual. The two were seen as one and the same. Worldly knowledge was seen as complementary and not contradictory to finding God. It is important to mention that despite all these different texts, more often than not, the main source of authority lies with the innumerable commentaries done by different masters. Many have written entire new works based on the wisdom of the Puranas and the Vedas. Unlike other religions, Sanatana Dharma is not held hostage by scripture. While eternal truths remain constant, practice and techniques will naturally move with the times. It is the teachings of the masters throughout history which has ensured the knowledge of scripture has remained alive and relevant to individuals today. In summary, one can see that no other religion or spiritual culture has developed such a huge body of writings. The ancient Hindu rishis have explored every avenue of life. Their intense search for truth and the longing to know God has given birth to an unimaginable wealth of knowledge. This knowledge has provided a roadmap for us to navigate our way through life. The Hindu scriptures make us aware of who we truly are. They give us an insight to recognise that there is a purpose to our existence. They compel us to see that we are not limited material beings, but spiritual beings who ultimately belong to God. Many thanks for listening.